Our thoughts are just, they're out there at the buffet. And so you can choose every day, I approve of myself. You can surround yourself with people that say, I approve of you. The reality is you can go to Google, you can listen to, you know, books like this, podcasts. You can, you can download books for three bucks or something that are really good. But guess what? You have to do the exercises in the book. Hello and welcome to The Real Success Show. I'm your host, Candice Mama. If you are sitting at home and you're saying to me, Candice, you do not know what I've gone through. I cannot see a day brighter than today. I am at the end of my rope. Then I assure you, today's conversation is exactly one that you would love to listen to and I believe you will benefit greatly from. Rock Thomas has an extraordinary life story, but he's also the founder of M1 Tribe and a property mogul. So before we jump into Rock's conversation, be sure that you are liking, sharing, and subscribing so that more people can find us. Now, without further ado, here's Rock Thomas. Rock, and welcome to The Real Success Show. It is honestly such a pleasure to have you here. Thank you. I'm thrilled to be here. Anytime we get the chance to do anything with you, it's always fun. Oh, good. Rock, I mean, I knew you as soon as you stepped onto our stages. I'd seen your story so many times and every single time it brought me to tears. Like I was just like, oh man. So when we had the privilege of having you, I was like, this is amazing. And I think what I really love is what you teach. But for people who are not familiar with you, how do you describe yourself? That's an evolving question because people keep on saying, oh, are you a motivational speaker? Are you this and that? Um, and so let me give you today's version is I think that I truly, after going through what I went through, I realized I have a gift of overcoming adversity. And I don't know if you know this, but I just got married a couple of weeks ago. Oh. And um, somebody stood up at the, at the wedding and they said, you know, let me tell you who Rock Thomas is. He goes, I've known Rock Thomas for a long time. And he says, he's somebody who just keeps on breaking the mold, breaking through where he's at, expanding his identity, reaching higher, reaching further, constantly growing, continuously curious, and always desiring to impact people. And so that's my quest. It's just, I, I live what I call above the line is I'm curious and I'm always looking for ways to grow and I'm committed to being a better version of myself. And, and then along the way, the energy you give off tends to just attract people. People are kind of like, well, who are you? Or like the other day I was walking by the pool and the guy stopped me, he goes, are you Rock Thomas? And I go, yes. And he goes, oh my God, I saw your video. Um, and my dad died and my mom was a wreck and your video saved our life. And so you start to realize that, mm -hmm. um, the story does matter and your story matters how you choose to live every day you know i got up i did yoga at 5 30 this morning i did my affirmations i um i affect my own thoughts and when you do that your vibration changes and you attract things and so then you just want to help other people do the same thing Man, that is powerful. I'm going to go into so many avenues from everything you said, but I first want to start by saying congratulations. That is incredible. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, very exciting. Very thrilled. Oh, that's mm -hmm. so beautiful. So coming back into everything you said there, you touched on so many points. And I love that that is what you hear back echo to you, you know, because there's so many things that we can believe about ourselves. And sometimes it's not an accurate, you know, translation of what the world sees about us. And so when someone said that about you, and they said, you know, Rock is someone who breaks through boundaries, he's committed to growth, he's committed to helping. I mean, that must have felt good, especially considering, you know, where you do come from. So I think the real question I want to get to there, Rock, is we've been living in this two years right? And so many people more than ever before have experienced some sort of a trauma and people are sitting at home and the story they're telling themselves is that my life is messed up rock. Like I am not getting up from this. Where can people even start thinking around their life? Well, I think you hit the nail on the head is that we are all storytellers. 
and nothing's really real. We keep on telling ourselves that the traffic annoys us or that we have a boss that we don't like or that our teeth aren't straight enough or that we're too skinny or we're too fat or whatever we heard. And so I'll give you an analogy I think that might work is if you've ever been to a hotel where they have a buffet and you step up and you, you know, usually the fruits first and then pancakes and eggs and maybe if somebody makes omelets for you, what have you. You can choose from all those different sources and you can give yourself nutrition or not. Now I want you to imagine behind the buffet are all the people that have influenced you. Your parents are behind there, your teachers, your coach, your siblings, maybe a minister. And all these people have given you words and given you suggestions. You're beautiful, you're smart, you're too tall, you'll never amount to much, life is difficult. And so what we did is we took all of these words and we identified with them and we made them us. And so that's all we can draw from for our story, Candice, is life is difficult. We heard it a thousand times from our parents. We witnessed it with our parents. And so we go out into the world and keep coloring ourselves. Life is difficult. You have to work hard. And so that's what we see and that's what we attract. So what I teach is let's put some new people behind the buffet line. Let's put some new voices so that when every day you go to feed yourself, the story can change. Life is fun. Life is beautiful. Life is graceful. You are amazing. I approve of myself. I am gorgeous. The biggest problem people have is a lack of self-love. It's right at the core of everything. They don't feel worthy. They don't feel lovable because of all the people that were behind that buffet that also had other people behind their buffet that were messed up. And until you do the work like I have done and other people do and you continue to do in your communities, people are only going to be able to draw from the words of the people that were behind the buffet that they've been exposed to. And so when I hang around people like Tony Robbins or other great teachers, they're telling me, say yes, Rock, say yes to taking action, move forward, walk on fire, you can do it. And you start to change the inner narrative and a circle back to what you said at the beginning is you tell yourself a different story and that's when it changes. Mm, that is so deeply profound. And Rock, coming back to telling ourselves stories, you have an incredible story and that is in many ways how I came into contact with you and your like your story and your work and your life for people who've never heard your story do you want to just share a little bit of how you grew up yeah sure um in Canada in Montreal Canada French part of the world uh, my parents got were, were from Europe both Dutch um, and ironically they came across separately and met when my father was uh, trying to get into his apartment door and he had a bag full of cans of soup and my mother was trying to get in her door and she looked at him and she goes is that dinner and he's like yeah and she goes maybe I could cook you a real meal and the rest is history but um they you know they went through the war and the programming of the people behind the buffet for them think about what that was like right hide Sirens going off, get in the bunker. There might be no food, you're gonna die, et cetera, et cetera. The Germans are coming. Um, fear, 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 fear in their bodies. So they fled to Canada and then they had me and my sister. And my father was just a very introverted um, person that um, he had to, my mother needed to give him three weeks before she could invite people to the house so he could prepare mentally. Just think of the programming there and the awkwardness with us kids. Anyway, they got divorced when I was five and um, I lived with my mother for a while. She was a gypsy. She spent a lot of time not at the house when we came home from school. So I ended up setting fire to things and looking for attention. And all of this sent me to my father's house when I was about nine years old, eight and a half, nine years old. And he had remarried and he lived on a farm now. And he was going to straighten rock out. 
He was going to, you know, I stole money from my mom's purse to go get some food because sometimes she wasn't home and I was hungry. It was a little thing kids do, but I got labeled as a liar and a thief and a troublemaker. And so when that happens, think about if your parents keep on telling you you're beautiful, smart, lovely, or keep on telling you you're a liar, you're a thief, you're no good for nothing, and you're going to go out and you're going to work and you're going to straighten yourself out, just think about the cocktail of possibility. So first I rebelled, but then when that didn't work because I was eight and a half, I couldn't take on my father and he had the control of the food and the circumstances, then I succumbed. And after I did that, I learned the most important lesson of my life is that life is happening for you, not to you. And when that happened, I became a champion of everything. Every, every task, every job, I said, I will do it better than he expects. I will do it deeper, longer. I'll paint it better. So that every time he came out to, it, to inspect it, I was, there was nothing he could say that wasn't good enough. I wanted him to be proud of me. And of course, as the story goes, um, I never hit that point. He always found something. But I think there's two types of people and we can label it fight or flight. And I was a fighter for some reason. I had something in me that wanted me to break through. So I just kept on finding ways to fight, to grow, to expand, to learn, uh, to get better. And I don't wanna say it's easy. I felt alone a lot. I felt like I didn't belong like a lot of people. But over time, when I really, Candace, went out into the real world by the time I was 17, the skills I had, the habits I had, I went to McDonald's, I did, I did the job of two people. I didn't even know it. They said like, Joe's sick, can you clean the, the, the lobby? It's only two people, just do your best. I easily did the job of two people. And so what happened is I went into the real world, I started getting all these promotions and all these opportunities because my father had schooled me on how to be somebody who can take action, not get tired, et cetera, et cetera. So with that, I was able, to accomplish a lot, but you know, this, the, the experience that I've learned, like, you know, I don't know what your upbringing is and your background is. And of course you're, you're physically beautiful. You're gorgeous to look at. Um, you have a, you know, an intelligence and, an, and a passion to help people. But what I learned is that, you know, as I became this dominant force, I also alienated myself from people. When I played sports, I had to crush the competition. And so everything became like, I had a hammer for everything. And so I, I didn't really do well with friends because I beat them at everything. I was better than them at everything. Um, and so I had to learn that skill. So if you're listening to this, maybe you didn't grow up in the environment I did. Maybe you didn't have a warrior as a father. Maybe you were had a soft environment. Maybe you learned compassion and patience and you have great listening skills. So you need to put yourself into an environment where you're going to grow your warrior muscle. Maybe you need to be a little tougher. Maybe you need to go take a kickboxing class. Maybe you need, you know what I mean? Do a tough mutter, some things like that. We've all been given an environment that shaped us, but there's usually some parts that need a little bit of rounding out. And so that's been my journey. I'm a much more compassionate person than I used to be because I didn't learn it. And so the journey of overcoming adversity is never ending. And it just depends on what you've been exposed to that your adversity is gonna be different than mine. But you need to be able to get yourself into environments going to force you to grow, get comfortable with being uncomfortable. And I guess so that's kind of the story of what happened to me. And, and when I tell the story on that video of the relationship with my father and so wanting, I think, you know, well over 100 million people have seen it. Children want their parents to be proud of them. And it's a driving force. And that kept me going for a long, long time until you realize that your parents are just the people that conceived you. And maybe you chose them or maybe you don't, if you believe in Louise Hay or things like that. But you can take the charge off of it a little bit when you realize that you know, there's a higher power. 
There's something that created you and they were the vehicle and vessel. Just because you grew up in an area code doesn't mean you have to live there for the rest of your life. And just because you had certain parents, it doesn't mean that you have to give up all your power to them and seek their approval for the rest of your life. And so when I started to get that, I started to expand. I started to become more complete and I changed my relationship to be more spiritual than seeking the approval of all the people around me. And I don't want to say, I don't care what you think about me, but it, it weighs less, if that makes sense. Mm. Everything there, there's just so much. Like I, oh, my brain was just going. And, you know, the big thing is you acknowledge that you didn't have the capabilities to relate to other people and I think a lot of us struggle to identify our own shortfalls and to be like oh this is how I am and you know people have to love it or leave it kind of thing so when you started doing that work as to how to relate to others you just shared with us you just got married uh, how did that process begin for you and how did it unfold well I think to be candid, uh, all of us are still working on it. You know, my mother came down here, she's 85, and um, she was uh, the highlight for a lot of people because she's got this wonderful, delightful, curious, crazy character. Um, but what she lacked while she was growing me up was being present and being a mom because she developed the muscle of being this kind of um, fun loving, playful person. And so she's she's mellowed that out and she's been more patient for me i struggled with um the story of not being enough so the tool i used was i'm going to be smarter faster quicker whatever than anybody else but i will tell you this that during that i maybe like some other people use some enhancers so you know alcohol drugs um Go to a party, uh, smoke a joint before you go. Um, so I went through that process of trying to figure out how can I belong? How do I fit in? How can I feel comfortable about myself so that I feel like, because one of the biggest things we want, Candice, is to belong. So many people, oh my gosh, if I had a dime for people that when they get down to it in my coaching and they tell me, like, I just, nobody's like me. Like, I'm just, I feel weird. I feel like I, I feel so different. Like I can't even tell people what I'm really thinking because they won't get me. And so most people are very secretly lonely. And so they don't go to parties or they don't go to the function or they don't whatever. And they tell and oh, I'm busy with the kids or this or that. And so we start lying to other people and then we feel shame and all kinds of things. So the work that I did was really about becoming transparent, and vulnerable and continually speaking the things that I was afraid to say. And then as you do that, you realize that it actually has the reverse effect is other people go, oh my God, I can't believe you were afraid, Rock. And I'm like, yeah, you afraid? I go, yeah. And they're like, God, that makes me feel so much better. And then I got the connection and the belonging that I actually wanted. There's so much power in the words me too, right? I think that's why the movement took off. I think that's why so many people resonate with those words because when someone shares a story, you share your story, you talk to people and you are vulnerable and you say, I was afraid to say that. And someone can look at you and be like, Oh my goodness, me too. That is where relationships get built, right? It is not, we can't relate to perfection as human beings. And I think the more we try to be perfect, the more we isolate ourselves from other people. You've emphasized, you know, the idea of the buffet. And I love, love, love that analogy. And, you know, when we in that buffet line and we are picking out either the good affirmations and the good words or, you know, the bad affirmation and the bad words, People will say, but Rock, like, how do I get there? Like, how do I start believing the good things about myself? How do people start on that journey? Well, there's a few ways. And this is one of the reasons that I'm a big believer of find your tribe. Uh, so if you find a tribe with your vibe, like I have a few tribes that I belong to and I've started that focus on 
um, winning the money game. And what I mean by that, you know, I, I, I'm good friends with a very, very successful um, interior designer from Los Angeles that has done Oprah's house and Ellen's house, makes lots of money, mostly in the restaurant interior design business and hotels. And when the pandemic hit, his whole business stopped completely. And so, um, you know, he had a real, real shock to what was going on in his world financially, et cetera. And so the thing I teach financially is you can make $600, you know, an hour as a doctor or 600,000 or whatever, but until you get cash flowing assets, things that make money in the, with, you know, in fluctuations in the market, like owning real estate is a great one or owning consistently some stocks that, you know, the S and P that goes up 10% a year for the last hundred years. When you have those in the background, you're not affected by the pandemic. You're not affected when your parents get sick. You're not affected when you break your leg. And so that's the first thing that I teach is, is a, and I create a tribe that talks about that. You know, another analogy I have for you is, you know how we all have apps on our phone, right? And some of the apps on our phone, we use a lot like Facebook or whatever, Instagram. Um, but some of them we don't use that much. Like I have a parking app so that when I park my car back in Canada, when I go there, I just go on the app and I pay for the spot. Well, I don't use it very much because I'm not back there very much. But when I do use it, it's really useful. So imagine that the apps you have that are not, you don't use very much are things like depression or frustration or the ones, the emotions you don't visit too often, but every once in a while they pop up. Well, if you wanna change your thought process is to create a new result in your life, you've gotta upload some new apps. 95% of your thoughts and my thoughts are the same tomorrow as they are today. And most of them are negative because we're run by our amygdala. So if you really want to change your thought process, you got to be intentional about it. And the most important thing, there's really two things, is affirmations or consuming and, you know, uh, listening to a show like this, um, listening to audiobooks, podcasts, et cetera, where you're reminded that you can choose different words. And the second thing is to be in that tribe of people that are going to start talking about the things that are going to move your life forward. So in our tribe, we talk about cash flowing assets and how to get them and, it, and the new things coming up like crypto or NFTs, et cetera, because most, I don't know if this is true for you, Candice, but maybe just as an example for your people, five years ago, were you making a living the way you are today? Oh no, not at all. Mm -mm. So you had to upload some new apps, get some new information, and then acquire the skill set to be able to do what you do today. It's no different for our thoughts. Our thoughts are just, they're out there at the buffet. And so you can choose every day, I approve of myself. You can surround yourself with people that say, I approve of you. You're beautiful, you're sexy, you're smart, you're fun, you're delicious, you're hardworking, you're lucky. Right. One of my best friends is really, really wealthy. He's constantly says, he just walks around saying, I feel lucky. I feel like something good is going to happen. Right. And I'm like, what do you mean? He goes, I don't know. I'm going to hit this golf shot. Probably going to hit a tree and go in the hole. I don't know. I just feel lucky. And stuff like that happens to him. You know, I swear to God. So think of all the words you can choose in the world. Select a bunch that you should no longer use, such as impossible or try or would or should, things like that, delete those, upload some new ones, but more importantly, surround yourself with a tribe of people that share the same values you do. Like I eat really healthy because I surround myself with people that make those choices. I love to improve my communication because I surround myself with people that want to have great relationships. And I have 45 different streams of income because I surround myself with people that are constantly looking at the new ways that the world is adapting to create wealth. And so those are the ways I think that are most important that people miss out 
just because they're born in a certain area code, Candace, you know, they talk to their neighbor who's broke or pissed off or upset or hates their job. And now you have to manage that emotion. Even Candace, if you think you're super intelligent, super intelligent, but I come along and I see you doing something, I go, why are you doing that? That's stupid. And you have to manage that energy, right? Mm. You have to go, no, that's not stupid. What? And so that consumes part of your energy of the day to defend how you feel about yourself. So the opposite is to surround yourself with people, not Pollyanna that are going to tell you stuff that isn't true, but people that are going to affirm the better parts of yourself and encourage you to expand into the parts that you say that you want to go toward. So choose your own thoughts wisely, create affirmations, of course, and, um, and surround yourself, find a tribe of people that resonate with what you value. I love the concept of find a tribe and I your company's called the M1 tribe, which is great. And so when you want when you created M1 tribe, what was the thinking behind that? Oh my gosh. You know, I've been a Tony Robbins trainer for 20 years and I love Tony. And if you're familiar with um, the four stages of consciousness, the first one is to me. That's when you believe life is happening to you and you're a victim. The second one is for me. That's when things are happening. But if you can see your way around them, you get to grow. The third one is through me. That's when you're more in alignment and maybe you meditate and you get an idea like this morning. Um, I was at yoga. And by the way, this metaphor I just gave you with the apps came to me this morning in yoga. I've never told anybody but you. Okay. And I, I, I love it because I think it's so appropriate. We need to delete some of those apps off of our phone that aren't serving us. And we need to intentionally go and surround ourselves with people that can tell us about the new apps that are going to really serve us, right? The new words, the new language, and the new communities. So if you are going to go through a process of becoming a better version of yourself, I looked at Tony Robbins as one of the vehicles. And then when I went there, I got so excited. I did 19, 19 events in 19 months. I became a trainer. I think the fastest ever to become a trainer for him. And then I did more events to serve. And I was so excited about that environment. And then I got really disappointed. I saw people come to these events. I saw them get jacked up excited. And then two years later, they came back and they were 20 pounds heavier than when I saw them. They got divorced. They were struggling with this, that, or the other. And I go, what is, what's going on? Like you, you got the formula. Tony gave you the formula. And then you went home. And what I realized is that environment will always win. So if you go to Tony Robbins or to Landmark or to, you listen to a podcast and you're a bubble and you're feeling great, and then you go back to your area code where you live, or you go back to your office environment, because we want to belong and connect with people, we often like, oh, hey, oh, yeah, have another beer, buddy. And you're like, I don't really want to. I want to get up tomorrow and do yoga. And you're like, oh, come on, man. Right? And so you have one and you break your rules. And that's why the tribe is so important. Because when you're with the tribe, like I just had an event here. Um, and we just served vegan food and no alcohol for three days. And so when you're, when you don't have the choice or option to put poison in your body, what happens? You all of a sudden feel better. And I can't tell you how many people that I coach for their mindset that come to my events and then see how I eat. And then they go home and they lose 20 pounds that they haven't been able to lose for 30 years, right? Because mentally we give them a new vision, but also nutritionally, We've given some new choices that the world doesn't give them. And so I started the tribe because selfishly, I wanted to be insulated from the cesspool of mediocrity that life offers us. And so I'm around hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and literally created hundreds of millionaires through this group by teaching them about cash flowing assets. Um, I just saw a post from one of my buddies who when I met him eight years ago, he's a mortgage broker, had zero homes. He now has 640 homes. He buys like one a month or two a month, and he just keeps on adding to it. So 
I started it to create a community. You can look at it as, you know, um, a golf course, a golf club, right? You play public or golf or a private course. It's a different energy. It's a different environment. There's different rules. It's different quality of people, right? So it's kind of like culling the herd. It's sifting and trying to get the top three or 4% of people that truly want to lead epic lives. In fact, our saying is it's a tribe of healthy, wealthy, generous people that choose to lead epic lives and don't apologize for being awesome. Oh, I love that affirmation. That's brilliant. And I love the generous and I love the non-apology. I love that, you know, people need to enjoy the life they've created, be generous with it and not apologize for it. I think that's incredible. For people who are sitting at home and listening to our podcast and they say, I want to do everything that Rock is talking about. I think it sounds incredible. It sounds so good. But right now I do not have the financial resources to change my environment. So where can they begin when they're structuring their life or when they're thinking about their future? Well, you know, what's interesting is that a lot of people that come to my environment because I have different levels in the mastermind and some are, you know, 25,000 and some are 500, let's say. Um, they're like, oh, well, next month, next month, I'll have the money. And the interesting thing is that unless you download new apps to your phone, it's not going to change, right? And so... Next month doesn't get easier. People think circumstances are going to get easier. What you really need to do is you need to decide to get better. When I joined Tony Robbins, um, I immediately jumped in the deep end and joined his mastermind called Platinum Partners. It was $100,000 US, which for us Canadians at the time was like 150000 right? It was way beyond what I had. But one of the things I teach, Candice, is say yes and figure it out later. When you say yes to something bigger than you, you send a message to the universe that you need some help. When you say, I'll wait until I have everything, the universe sends the resources to somebody else like Rock Thomas, right? Because when you are expanding, the universe wants to join you. Everything in the universe is about growth. Nature grows. It's growing all the time, never stops or it dies. And if you keep on waiting for yourself to have everything you need you're breaking one of the laws so i said yes i figured out a way to make the first payment got into the group and then met somebody who with one conversation taught me how to make an extra hundred thousand dollars a year with one meeting i didn't know what i was i was running a real estate office but i missed one of the ways that you can make money and charge people for coming into your office and sell mortgages i didn't have to do anything more I just was thinking like this, like a, you know, a five figure person. And he was thinking like a seven figure person. So the, the, the big thing that people have to do is they've got to find a way to scrape together that first $500 or that first $5,000. They got to fight for it. That's their test. I have asked people that say, oh, I want to be in the environment. How many hours a week do you work? Oh, about 35 or 40. All right, good. Get a side hustle, get a side job for the next two or three months and save up the money. And if you don't, want to do that, then you don't want this bad enough. Mm. And then the other answer is that the reality is you can go to Google, you can listen to, you know, comes like this podcasts, you can, you can download books for three bucks or something that are really good. But guess what? You have to do the exercises in the book. You can't just consume the information and go, that's a really nice concept doing affirmations and then not do them. Oh yeah, I should reflect and review my day and see where I messed up. And if you don't do that, it doesn't happen, right? So many people in personal development talk about morning routines. I'm a, I love morning routines and I have mine, but I think the piece that is missing is the evening routine. When I take my journal and I reflect on my day and I celebrate those magic moments, and I appreciate them. The time when I laughed, the time when I was, you know, I held the door open for somebody. Um, and I have a series of questions I ask myself, you know, what did I enjoy? What did I do great? What did I learn? Where did I mess up? How could I do better? And then you do that on a repeated basis at the end of the day, then you become like the professional athlete that reviews the film constantly and can make the tweaks and the minor changes. And then you compound that over time and you become a better version of yourself. And so 
all that's available for somebody at zero cost. But most of the time, they won't do it because they're not part of a community and they want to be part of a community. So their friends are watching TV in the living room and they want to go and do their journaling. So they go to the living room and watch TV. But when you're part of a community that prides themselves on execution toward greatness, then all of a sudden that's respected. And you say to the group of people, hey, I'm going to journal. They're like, hey, man, oh, yeah, good. Hey, maybe I'll do it too. Hey, let's turn off the TV. Let's all journal, right? And so you change the value system of the people you're around. So you start where you can start. You fight. And I'll leave you with this one other thought is if you always give your money to poor people, to the person that's broke on the road, um, you exchange energy with that person. You move a little closer to being bogged down. When I gave $100,000 to Tony Robbins, I bought into his energy and his energy was above mine. So he pulled me up. So when you don't invest in yourself, when you don't put money toward people that have figured something out that they can help you accelerate, you retard your progress. And success is never done alone. And so one of the things I teach is 10% of what you earn goes to your education fund and then get excited and think, what person out there has mastered something that I can write them a check, I can send them some money and I can tap into their energy and they can help take me from the fourth floor to the 10th floor. And so that's a concept I think that a lot of people miss. It's like, I don't want to invest in that. I try to figure it out on my own. They try to do cheap and they try to just download a book or get a book for free or hack the system. You're screwing yourself. Mm -hmm. I've spent over $2 million on personal development and happily, happily give people money so I can exchange for their energy. I love the concept of exchanging for energy. I've never thought of it. And I think it's a brilliant concept because it is so true, right? It's the relationship you have with that exchange, I think is so powerful. And you mentioned as you were speaking that people have to fight for it. And I think that is so true because what I tend to encounter, even in my work as a speaker, is a lot of people will say to me, oh, you know, if you're such a good person or they're like guilt me, they'll try and guilt me in some way. They're like, you can't sell forgiveness, you know, or whatever the case is or courses on forgiveness. Um, and initially, I actually did believe that, Rock. I was like, oh, my goodness, you know, like, what kind of a person am I? Like, I've got this knowledge and I'm selling it. And, that. and then a teacher of mine said to me, she was like, charge for your service. And then I want you to compare the growth between the people you charged as opposed to the people you didn't. And honestly, although it gave me anxiety to charge for the first time, when I measured the progress, it wasn't even on the same scale. Like it, it, I couldn't even compare it because the people that got it for free, honestly, just didn't implement it. They heard it, they let it go. Whereas the people who were paying for it were so invested because they were so desperate to forgive, to release, to let go. And so in your work, Rock, when you encounter those people, and I mean in any arena, but especially in this arena, and they say to you, oh, Rock, why can't you just give me your courses for free? Why can't you just trust that I'm going to perform in your program if your program is, is so great? What do you say to people? I mean, it's people don't usually say it directly to me that way. They're just, they make up a story like I can't afford it or it's not the right time. or got to check with my wife. So it's, it's more set in code, but um, when they do in, sometimes try to negotiate or what, something like that is I usually just say to them, listen, it's a hundred percent money back guarantee. And I believe I will transform your life if you pay because when you pay you pay attention so why don't we start off there and if after 30 days or whatever it is you're not showing up for yourself then you can quit on you but i guarantee you i won't quit on you i've got a history i'm 59 years old you just look at my pedigree of all the people i've affected and the history of the companies i've built i'm not i'm not a book smart guy that you know just like read a book and i'm regurgitating I have 
many, many businesses. I have medical clinics, I have solar company, I have real estate with over 250 salespeople, number one in my area. So I'm doing it in the real world day in and day out. And I charge $2,000 an hour for coaching. So if you can get a piece of my recording or information or access, or even if I speak to a small group in a mastermind community, you're drinking from the well. And if that doesn't resonate with you or it doesn't seem right, then you're not ready and that's okay. So, I mean, like uh, my life won't change that much if you join or you sign up, but yours stands to gain a lot. Hmm. So Rock, in all of the things you do, you know, you're so impactful, you have all these businesses, as you mentioned, like what are things that you do to like, just break free, like to just have a good time? Well, I just went to Los Angeles for the weekend. We went to um, the gentleman I was telling you that uh, did the, de the decorations for Ellen and for Oprah. Um, we went to a party at his house, just about 12 people um, with a good friend of ours that's a vegan chef. So we just hung out, we did that. I went for um, a pedicure and a manicure with my lady. Um, then we went for a massage. Um, we stayed at a good friend's house, so we socialized a little bit with her. Then the following day, we went to um, a friend's party. She was um, to about 150 people over at her house, so we did that. Um, so those are some things I do, but I'm, a, I'm an active person, so really what I like to do is golf, tennis, um, pickleball, um, yoga, and whatever I can that is physical and moving go out to dinner with a few friends. Um, I love yoga, meditation, reading, learning. And the rest of the time, quite frankly, I'm usually teaching and giving and serving. And that's what I like to do. So it's, it's, a, it's a mixture of that along with spending time with my family and my kids and my mom, et cetera. I love that. And in the beginning of our talk, you were talking about, you know, uh, you, your like not your value system, but I want it like your progression, your dedication to growth, and you know that you're ever evolving. And I love to hear that. Over the past year, what do you think is the greatest thing that has changed for you? Where you look at yourself and you're like, "Yep, this is the greatest change I've made in this past year." I would say it started a couple of years ago when I chose to do 75 days in a row of yoga. I used to be a guy that hit the gym all the time and pound the weights and, um, and that's what I kind of valued. Something happened during that period of time that I got a connection with um, creator, spirit, whatever you want. And it just changed my priorities. I became, um, I went from like a lot of my life was, was to me and then I evolved to um, by me, like an achiever. And I think I've moved now to the third level of consciousness more is through me. So I allow things to come to me. I'm more intuitive. Um, I'm going to hire somebody and I'm, I'm rather than just looking at their paperwork, I'm feeling the situation. And I'm like, this doesn't feel right. I don't even know why, but it doesn't feel right. So it's been a lot less effort because it used to be the achiever model grind go. And now things are just coming to me. And so that's been the biggest shift for me in the last couple of years. And um, it's been a nice relief because when you've been grinding for a long time, you're like, does that have to continue like this forever, right? So um, I would say that's, that's the biggest thing. Slowing down, just allowing and letting go. Letting go of you know, like not being so tough on myself. You made a bad investment. You let it go. You you said something wrong to somebody and then you just let that go. A lot of self-forgiveness and a lot of self-love. And what happens is you end up having so much more for other people too. Because you're like, oh my God, I know they're tough on themselves. I know they're beating themselves up right now. And like I was in yoga this morning and I got caught in that idea mode and I didn't do the exercises. So the girl came up and she... When people are like that, they put like a cold cloth on you because they think you're overtired. And I wasn't. And I don't like cold on my back. 
And so she went to put this cloth on my back and I kind of shoot her off and then finished the yoga. And then I went to her afterwards and I looked her in the eye and I said, I'm sorry if I didn't receive the gift you were giving me. It's just that I got into this zone of meditation and you were kind of knocking me out of that. So I was having a moment with myself and I know you were trying to serve me. So I apologize if I made you feel bad. And so it's things like that, that allows you a moment of connection and a moment of appreciation. Because guess what? If that never happens and keep, people keep on doing that, now anytime she's gonna go put a cold cloth on people, what's she gonna do? Hesitate, tell herself a story. What if, what if they don't want it, right? So this kind of clears that. It gives her the information to serve and continue to serve and lets her know that I care what she did and that I gave her a, a perspective of what was happening for me so she could appreciate it. And so little things like that is what's changed for Rock Thomas. Oh, that is so beautiful. And what a beautiful growth. It's like there's this saying in the spiritual community. I don't know if you've heard it, which is masculine as opposed to feminine energy. And masculine energy is where you've been operating that like, go, 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 go. And feminine energy is so much more receptive. It trusts, it flows, you know. And how much of stepping into that energy has allowed you to really solidify that self-love within yourself? Yeah, I mean, you bring up an interesting conversation because I teach a course called Men Fully Expressed where we talk about masculine and feminine energy and the dance, right? Because we both as humans, the feminine and masculine have both. And so I would say that understanding that a lot of men think that feminine energy is weak from their perspective um, and letting myself appreciate that it is not has definitely allowed me to. I, I look at it as 88 keys on the piano, you know, masculine, blah, 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 down here in the feminine. Dee, 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 dee. Um, how many of the keys can I play? And how many can I allow the person I'm with as we dance and play? You know, it's like my wife, when we check out of a hotel, she goes down to the reception, she looks at the bill, she double checks it, and then I'm with the bags on the curb waiting for the, the car which is usually reversed roles, you know, if you look at masculine and feminine. And, um, and then she comes out and she's like, guess how much money I say? And I'm like, how much? And she goes, you know, $124. And I'm like, oh, that's amazing, baby. And she's in her masculine in that moment, right? She's driven, she's focused, she's getting results, she's making things happen. And I'm cheering her on and applauding her and recognizing her. And so, I don't think if I, had, if I didn't have that wisdom or experience or that app on my phone about masculine and feminine energy, I wouldn't be able to appreciate that dance. And so that's a whole other spectrum of education I'm very passionate about that I think enables people to be more intimate and to appreciate each other. Has there been resistance to that concept? I mean, I can imagine if you are telling men, like, especially because you're very macho, right? Like people would look at you as like hard, like, and then they like, you start speaking about feminine energy. I'm sure they're like, huh? <laughs> you know? So have other men been resistant to it or no? You know, I Candace, I would say that this is my best work. I started um, about 10 months ago and I did a three month, once a week call of 90 minutes and started off with 20 gentlemen. And we got to the end of the three months and we just had so many breakthroughs and ahas, et cetera. I said, do you guys want to continue? all 20 signed up again, every single one. We got to the end of the six months, 19 of the 20 signed up for another three months. And the only reason the other guy did, couldn't, is because he had a conflict in his schedule. And so um, I think that, I mean, yes, maybe I look macho, but I cry at movies and I'm emotional. And so when I go through, we have 33, 32 tenants that I, I speak uh, about, right? It's like, it's never the problem. It's the state you're in when you deal with the problem. The problem doesn't need to be always solved in the moment. You need to be present, right? So we teach all these things. The man is three Ps, right? He needs to provide, protect, and be present. So as you go through all these things, people are like, man, or I think Rock's figured a couple of things out, you know? And so 
it's not about, you know, is he, is he masculine or feminine? It's about the way I'm able to communicate the information and the experience and the, well, the $2 million I talked about, I've taken a lot of courses on masculine and feminine energy, David Data, I've hung out with him for two days. And, and so I just have never taught it until this last year. And now that I'm teaching it, I'm realizing the wounds that people have in their relationships are usually covered up with food or alcohol or pills or working hard or working out or video games or pornography, et cetera, et cetera. And so I teach men how to um, stop what I call the leaking of energy to places that is just taking you out of the emotion you're afraid of. So, you know, a man comes home to, 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 to his woman and he walks in the door and what he sees are downward turned lips. He makes up a story that she's pissed off. So he doesn't want to be around her because men want masculine and wants women to be happy. So what happens is he tries to squeeze into the fridge to grab a beer and head into the garage where he can do some work or listen to the baseball game or what have you and make up some story that he's got to do something because he doesn't want to have to deal with her emotion, whatever it is. And so there's a separation that happens. She doesn't feel seen or heard or he's not present to her. And so now when they go to bed that night, she doesn't open himself up to her, to him because they didn't connect. And then he's pissed off. So he uses pornography as a way to feel good about himself because there he's not going to be rejected. And then when she said, catches him at it, he lies about it and it all unravels. And you have two liars living with each other. You really just have two people that don't know how to communicate. And they don't know how to have hold space for each other. And it's very sad for me because there's so many people, like my wife runs a woman's group, I run the men's group. And so we get to find out what's happening behind the lines. And most couples are not even having anywhere near the amount of sex that they want, not even close, yet they both want it. So I'm helping facilitate those pieces and, and um, jokingly I say to people, but it's true, you take my course, you will have more sex, right? Um, so it's just the way it is because we start to break down some of the poor communication styles and the men want to do better. We do. We just lack the information. And we lack somebody that can coach them and guide them on a how to handle the complexity of the feminine. The feminine is complex. And there's, you know, they should teach it in school. The part that I understand is like, like you can have a baby that's going to be for a lifetime, but you don't need a license. You don't need to take any course. You can get married. It's supposed to be for a lifetime. You don't have to take any course. But, oh, you want to sell a piece of real estate? You need to take a course for nine months. You know, it's like we got it a little bit backwards, I think. Wow. Oh, Rock. Honestly, like I could have listened to you speak for hours on this topic because I think it is something that I love learning about. It's something that I find so impactful when people come into that teaching and they start to realize that it's not about man, woman. It's not about the biological makeup. It's more so about like the nature of feminine, the nature of masculine and how we embody it within ourselves. And the way you were speaking about it, I was just like, blown away so blown away I was like why did I not start here um, <laughs> <laughs> but I honestly do look forward to your keynotes and I'm hoping this is a subject matter that you're going to be speaking about because this is life-changing I think when people encounter it I'm yet to meet someone who's not changed by it um, but now that we're coming to the end of our interview like I'm devastated um, <laughs> I have two final questions for you the first one is, what is real success to you? One of my favorite words is harmony. Um, and so when I'm in harmony with wherever I'm at, um, I think I, I have appreciation and I have gratitude. Um, like I, I wake up with an acronym called GGA. So it's grace, gratitude, and acceptance. 
And so while I lie in bed and I'm about to wake up, I think of just everything that is grace is being created, is available, is happening. Um, gratitude, and I think about just the sheets that I have, my wife, warm body beside me, and I just bathe in gratitude. And then I just think, you know, how can I accept today all of the things coming to me and appreciate uh, the problems, the challenges, the good, the bad, the ugly, um, because it would be boring if everything was just great all the time. So maybe one of the keys to life is to be able to accept, right? Tony says, change your expectations for your appreciation when you change your life. So I think success is continually having a hunger to grow and to contribute wherever you are. You're responsible for the energy you bring into the room. So I pride myself on that. And then GGA, grace, gratitude, and acceptance. And so to me, that's success. Well, that's beautiful. And the final, final question is, what is one thing about Rock Thomas that we will not find on Google? Um, okay. Um, A lot out there, so I'm thinking. <laughs> um, I mean, I, I think we probably covered it before, but I, I would say I can be misinterpreted because most of my life I've been so hard charging. I have, um, I have hurt some people along the way. I have crushed other people's businesses. Um, I have pissed some people off, and I think. What people don't know is that there was just a there was just an afraid little boy inside that I wasn't enough. And the tool I had was to win, but I didn't know how to win elegantly. And so I won sometimes by crushing people in business or um, in sports or making them feel bad so I could feel good. So I think what you won't see is is that. Deep down inside, there's a loving, kind, beautiful soul that just did the best he could at that time. Oof, that was beautiful. And it's such a great way to end this. And Rock, this has been, honestly been such a beautiful conversation. Thank you so much. Yeah, my pleasure, Candice. You are such a um, fantastic listener. You have great presence. And so... It makes it easy to unwind the story. You're very good at what you do. Thank you, Rock. I appreciate that. I absolutely love that conversation. And I know I say it every single time, but I mean it every single time. I hope you guys got a lot of benefit from this. And if you did, make sure that you are commenting and letting us know what stood out for you. As always, I will always recommend that you go through our playlist because we speak to some phenomenal people and make sure that you catch up on all our episodes. Now, it has been an honor to serve you and it always is 